Good evening, everyone. How are y'all doing this evening? We welcome you to Midweek Bible Study at Living Hope Cathedral Bible Institute. Um, this evening, we'll be studying from the book of um, Luke chapter 5, um, where we picked up from last, um, last um, Bible study. And um, we're going to be talking about some miracles that Jesus did. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'll do the reading of the the um, passage scripture, and then we're going to dive into it. But before we do that, I just want to open us up in a word of prayer. And we are so grateful for each and every one of you who are joining us this evening. Um, again, we are studying the book of Luke chapter 5 at this evening Bible Institute. Heavenly Father and God, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you, O oh God, that we are able to pause. We have able to pause to to take a breath in of your presence. And as we bow down and we worship you, we ask, oh God, that you will do what you have always done in our lives, oh God. May we be, um, from studying your word, may you reveal yourself, may you reveal your heart, may we reveal your, your direction for your people. And we pray, oh God, that we all will be willing to make any adjustments to our lives that your scripture has shown that we need to do. We thank you for those who are joining us via the Facebook feed. We also pray for them and we pray for a special blessing on them as we interact this evening, oh God. May our discussions be fulfilling and may, may we have a great time in your presence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So the passage scripture starts out with um, the disciples being called and, um, and I'm going to read from verse 1 to 3 and it says, so it was as the multitudes press about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But a fisherman had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which belonged to um, Simon, and asked him to put on out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. And so Jesus had just started his earthly ministry and he is walking, um, he's, he's um, being surrounded by a lot of people. And so therefore he decided that instead of staying and, um, and being around the crowd, he went into the boat and that's where his, his, um, his um, presentation was being made from the boat. And um, the fact that we had seen it being described as a large crowd tells us how popular Jesus' ministry was at this time. Um, he was um, a popular teacher of the gospel, and so he had to get away from this crowd and join them by, um, taught, taught them, sorry, from the boat. And um, the multitudes were taught as a result of that. And then it discussed who the boat belonged to. It said that one of the, boat belo one of the boats belonged to Simon. And so, you know, the fact that, you know, you have a, um, a boat and God, um, Jesus is coming and asking to use your boat is quite, quite a bit of an honor, I think. So I think that Simon might have been very pleased um, to have this privilege to allow the popular teacher to use his, um, his boat, which he uses um, for his lifestyle because he was a fisherman. And so Jesus is teaching from Simon's boat and um, Simon is listening, I'm sure, while all the others who were on the crowd was also listening to the presentation. And then it says that when he starts speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Yes. But Simon answered and said to him, master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and the net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. So, so first you see that Simon was kind to allow Jesus to use his boat as I just mentioned. And now um, Jesus is now directing um, Simon on how to become more effective with his fishing efforts. Um, and so, you know, first Jesus um, gave, Simon gave to Jesus, and now Jesus is blessing Simon by giving back to him this knowledge. Oh, you could be puffed up and be saying, well, you know, I'm a fisherman for all these years. I've actually worked before this occurred 
we can get the impression that before Jesus is using the boat, that they actually were out in the um, in the ocean um, fishing. And then they probably came back in with little catch and they are sitting there, cleaned up the boats probably, and Jesus came over to use it. That's what I imagine was the scene. And so they, they are now at the end of the day, work all night, the boat has been occupied by these summons, and now the man is telling him, quote unquote, to go back out and fish. So Simon could take an attitude and say, you know, we've done this all night. There is nothing, as he said, there's nothing out there and choose not to go. But instead of, of, of pointing out the obvious and choose not to go, Simon instead said that, you know, um, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And so he therefore um, decided to release his, his, his common sense and his past experience to take that advice of the master of Jesus who he had just um, you know, come in contact with. And so, and so after that, um, he, 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 he could have said, like I mentioned, that he was tired. He was there all night. Um, he, he is a fisherman. As far as he know, Jesus' only experience is being a carpenter because he, began, he came from a carpenter family. And um, some of the time um, to fish is usually at nighttime and not so much during the day. And so who, you know, most fishermen, you know, at least the ones I see in, in Angola, they would tend to go early morning and catch the fish and come back on because during the day, those of us who do it for pleasure, we'll go during the day. But if you want to be a true fisherman, you normally do it at nighttime. So even the timing that he's choosing to do it might not have been the wisest according to, 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 to the common sense of Simon. And then um, the, the, the environment that they were in, you know, they were in an um, a area where there were a lot of people around. And sometimes that, that could also be, be, you know, a loud music, a loud sounds, the fish will run, you know. So you could like find a lot of excuses as to why going ahead and following this instruction would not have been the um the, the best thing to do and of course as i mentioned they had just come in so they probably already had had packed up this, this ship so to speak clean the nets off and were ready to go home and now jesus is telling them that you don't um you need to go back out and put put your nets out and they decided to, to he decided to obey and said nevertheless so what are your thoughts about for that um and that's a that's a very good um insight this is documenting jesus call to his first disciples and sometimes as you begin to drill down you begin to notice some nuances um the first thing we know that with mark um, as mark tells the story mark only focuses on the fact that jesus came along um the sea of galilee and one says um i mean luke says calls it by a different name uh, but mark says the sea of galilee but there was three names that was commonly used for that body of water at the time. There was the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee, and then also this Genesaret, um, which um, makes reference to the same body of water. And it was used for fishing. And so most of the villages around it, that's what they did. Um, my wonderful was that Jesus came at a, at a particular time of the day, and he said, follow me now, I'll make you fishers of men. Because Mark is kind of hastening over it, he didn't get down to the details. But Luke thought it was important for us to share about how he actually called these men. And they said that um, that Peter and them left their nets and followed them. Then he went down further to the shoreline, met the sons of Zebedee. They were with their father, with their father um, in their nets. He says Peter then was um, cleaning their nets. These other guys were mending their nets. And he says to them, follow me. And they did. I will make you fishers of men. Um, Luke, though, spent quite a bit of time um, actually going to the details, which I believe is important. One of the first things we notice is how Peter, how Peter Simon responds in, in verse five. And what it tells me, and I, I want to highlight this, is that even though he's beginning to call them for the first time as disciples, the way that Peter responds to them speaks of a relationship that was already established. And so it seems like even though Jesus um, had not yet called him for the purpose of being involved with him in ministry. He he actually had spent some time 
um, build him a relationship with them. And in order to do that, um, his first encounters with them probably had nothing at all to do with, uh, with uh, the fact that he wanted them to be disciples or to be engaged with him in ministry. He probably got around them and began to ask Christians or show interest in what they were doing in terms of being fishermen, um, how to fish. And so they de developed that relationship with him with Simon now calling him master. Before he even calls them and tells them he wanted them to go fish for men, Simon ha has already elevated him to the status of calling him um, his master are giving him a title of respect um, based on the relationship. And so that's important for us because many times we would like to evangelize people, we would like to Christianize them and bring them to the faith. And we just abruptly comes into people's face um, and then tell them about Christ and we want them to get saved, baptized and be part of our church. But it seemed like Jesus' technique or strategy was a lot different. That he actually invested time building a genuine relationship with people from which then he can um, mentor them or transition them into the gospel or into the ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, uh, into serving with him and serving God with him while he was on the earth. And um, and then we will point out something that was very interesting is that the circumstances was not right. And Simon knew that. So he knew the circumstances was wrong. He knew the time was wrong. He knew that the conditions didn't favor them. He also knew that they were tired that they had um, gone according to the wisdom of the prescribed training and it has yielded nothing. But because of the relationship he had with Jesus, he believed in Jesus. And so he's saying, nevertheless, it's like, okay, based on just your credibility, because everything else is wrong. The only thing I have to go on is that you ask. And so the whole premise for the story, uh, Jesus has began to warm their hearts um, about going with him in ministry is that because Christ acts and Peter believed in him based on the relationship they had, he was willing to go out and try again, irrespective of the fact that the circumstances was wrong, the time was wrong, and he had yielded no efforts and with the same circumstances from before. And so that's something that stood out for me. And the other thing that I, I actually thought interesting is that if it happened according to the, the, the report of Mark, but Jesus just came along, they had just had dismal failure in an era of their life where they had spent their whole lives being their profession. And Jesus said, come to me. Then they'll be living a life of failure to go serve um, God in catching men. But Jesus actually set them up where they're able to transition from their career at a high point. Where they're making the sacrifice, not being failures, meaning like, oh, we fish, we caught nothing. So you know what? We might as well go and preach the gospel because you know we're not even good at fishing anyway. Jesus actually set it up that they're transitioning out of hearts that are voluntary. They are saying, yes, we want to go and catch men, not because we're not good at fishing, because our last event, we're actually um, overwhelmingly successful. We are so successful that the, uh, the, the sons of Zebedee who partners with us has to come up and help us draw in the catch. And when we put it on board of the vessels, on board of the boats, both vessels begin to sink. And so that's overwhelming success. So the Lord Jesus Christ grants them overwhelming success. And then he turns to them and says, now, uh, in the face of this overwhelming success, I want you to become fishers of men. But he will also um, give them a message that just like how they were catching these fish alive in their nets is how he wants them to go after men who are alive. He wants them to go after living beings, uh, men, and draw them not as dead, um, fish are dead men, but as living men in into the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then to work with them from there. And so that's what I got out of the story is that that there was actually an, a pre-existing relationship even before Jesus got to the point of calling them to serve with Him in His earthly ministry. Thank you. So, so I think what we have to realize then that one of the worst, as um, excuse me, might say, well, you know, we've done this all the time and we fail at it, so we don't need to continue doing it. Um, that, that that might be true in your human sense, but if God is the one who's directing you to, to try it again and do it a different way with his instructions, then we should be always willing, like Peter and his friends were, to respond to God's invitation and do it God's way. Yes. Not because you've done it before and it's failed, mean that you can't do it again. Yeah. Do it God's way. And like Peter said, nevertheless, at your command, I'll do it. That should all be our response, not to just justify why we need to throw in the towel and give up now because we've been failing. 
I, I think it also goes to purpose, like we've been talking about, is that when you when you're convicted about the purpose that it's important for men to be saved, that for God so little world that He sends His only Son into the world, that this is so this is like a, a high priority to God. That even when you're failing, the answer is not to give up and stop, but to continue to find ways of drawing those men into the gospel. And so a lot of times we become angry a bit and says, "Oh, people don't care about the gospel. They don't want to hear. They don't want to change. Uh, it's never going to change." And we see a lot of things that are so contrary to how God wants us to be. And Paul actually had a heart of God. You see, I became all things to all men. And so he was always seeking creative ways of winning people to Christ. He said, like, if, if somebody was a certain way, he said, then I, I developed that trust so I could win that person to Christ. And then if, if I went to another person, that strategy didn't work. He said, then I, I adopted and modified my strategy so I could win some to Christ. He said, I didn't win all, but it allowed me to win some. And so Paul understood two things, that yes, you're not going to win all, but that's not a reason to give up and quit. And then you're going to have to change your strategies based on who you're targeting in order to bring them into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But our attitude should never be, oh, I give up. You know, I ain't going to do I know Padre we got to evangelize, we got to um, build relationships with people, but they ain't got no interest in the gospel. People didn't want to be saved and just write them off. Writing, writing the world off is not a solution and it's not something that God wants us to embrace. He wants us to be always praying for their salvation, but he also, he also wants us to be always laboring and trying to find ways where we could connect with them from a relational standpoint, build relationships with men, and then use those um, relationships as venues or, or access points to begin to share with them the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the other thing too is that, um, as you mentioned, he had to call for help at the end when he got the catch. And you know, a lot of times, sometimes we just want to keep them all for ourselves. And so we rather them spill out the needs of outside there than to to um, to to um, ask others to help us. And this illustration here is showing that that when they got the catch, it was so much that it wasn't enough. There was too much for them to handle themselves. And they were willing to partner with other people to get them, you know, to, to help with the discipling, discipling, so to speak, of the fish. <laughs> and I and and I believe you also making that point that I'm about to call you to catch men, but you're gonna have to partner with each other. That the reason we're gonna need 12 men to this to, to disciple me by the time Jesus was getting ready to end his ministry in three and a half years, they said at one point he sent out 72 disciples. And so we see that the, the, whole act, the whole act of calling disciples, even though we saw the initial where he appointed 12, was an ongoing process of always calling disciples. Because he started with Simon, then he added, added the sons of Zebedee. But by the time he came to the end of his earthly ministry in three and a half years, he was actually sending out 72 men where he blessed and anointed them to go out and share their faith and perform miracles. And so we see that the whole act of disciple making was an ongoing process that begins with one or two people but continue to grow and to each one he used different methods to reach them i think he was able to reach simon because he actually asked him to use his boat so as, as simon has seen him using his boat he's like why would he want to use my boat to preach from you know that maybe there were cousin people preaching in the synagogue but here's jesus using an everyday tool like a vessel standing in his boat and preaching and then simon began to realize like he could be part of what jesus is doing now, if he had met Jesus in the synagogue as a priest in his gummy, like, oh, yeah, I can't be that. I'll never be that. I'll raise a fisherman. My father's a fisherman. We'll always be fishermen. I mean, fishers, yeah, fishermen, and not fishers of men. But by Jesus being willing to be in his environment and using what was a tool that he used every day to catch fish, Simon could relate to him. And I believe Jesus made himself relatable. So not only was he relational, he was also relatable in terms of how he reached people uh, with the gospel of our Lord and Savior, with, with, with his ministry or involving them in his earthly ministry. So in chapter verses um, 8 through 11, uh, when Simon saw it, he fell down at Jesus on me saying, oh, sorry, I skipped. No, I, I that's correct. Um, Jesus is saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. O oh, Lord, for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish, which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. 
From now on, you will catch men. So when they have brought their boat to land, they forsook all to follow him. Amen. And so we see, we see that Mark said the same thing, but Mark did not tell the story. Mark just said um, in Mark chapter 1, verses, I believe it's 16 to 19, three verses. Jesus came along the beach. He says, follow me. I'll make you fish of the month. Simon left and followed him. Then he said to the sons of Zebedee, and they left and followed him. And so he, he did not place as much value as Luke did. But Luke is sharing with us the story. If we spend time with it, it begins to teach us several things about how we, we ourselves could be effective in winning others to the gospel of Jesus to Christ, how we can be uh, relational and how we could be relatable and how the people can identify with us um, and we can identify with them because of how the methods are how we choose to be part of the environment that is natural to them. The Bible says you are in the world, but not be of the world. And so he was talking about being in the world and having influence in the world and on the people of the world, but not letting the world influence us where we become like them. And sadly, what happened with a lot of believers, when we go back out and into the world, when the people were Christ, we believe that we have to become street, that we have to become like them and begin acting like them and using their words and totally lose our ability to influence them. We can put ourselves in their space or in their marketplace, but we don't have to become them in order to win them, if, if, if that is understood. Um, and I believe that Christ did an excellent job of showing us how that is done. Um, even describing the Pharisees had a difficult time with Jesus in his ministry. They couldn't dispute how effective he was. They saw the multitude, they saw the miracles, and they saw people who every time wanted to be part of what he was doing on the earth. But um, they always marvel and say, oh, he's always um, drinking with sinners and hanging out with um, people that they wouldn't associate with. Uh, but yet they could not deny his effectiveness. And that is always the problem with religious people is that they would like to have the same impact. But you're not able to do so because you've created a wall of separation um, that creates in people's mind that you are better than and that's what, when, when Simon saw the miracle, he was like, oh, I'm a sinful man, depart from me. Uh, again, embracing separation. I'm not worthy to be around you. I'm not worthy to have you in my boat. I'm not worthy to be even a part of what you're doing. You're so different than me. He just says, no, we are the same. You can actually be a part of what I am doing. I want you to be a part. And I'm inviting you through the very same experience that you think should separate us to become a part of what I'm doing on earth and to help me um, go fishing for men. Yeah, because as it, well. it would seem strange that, that Simon would tell him to depart from him at that point in time because Simon was, he was there with Simon for the whole time as we just discussed. But yet, when, when Simon saw his power, yes, his power. That, that made Simon realize that was there was a big difference between them because difference. maybe at first, um, because as we were saying, that this is probably not the first time these men had met Jesus. Right. They met him and they probably just thought he was a good teacher. Yeah. You know, a master, a, a guy yeah, who a good play on, yeah. shows up on the beach. Well and yeah. good. But then when, they, when he saw the level of the miracle, which was a big miracle for Simon, because like he said, he was out there all night doing it and it wasn't happening. Then um, he realized how, how he realized his true position compared to Christ. Right. And all of us are, are she, um, have gone astray. All of us are sinful men. Um, and when we come before God, um, once we realize that, acknowledge that, and ask for, for his forgiveness, then we can all be invited to be part of what he's doing. So I'd like to ask you um, another question. I, somebody wanted to say something, then I'm going to ask a question. Yeah, sorry about this. This is Brother T. I'm just jumping in. Um, if I can go back to verse 4. Mm -hmm. When God told him to launch out into the deep, he said, let down your nets, plural. Mm -hmm. And he said, for the draft. But then it shows in the next verse that he, that he only... Um, let down a net, singular, right? So that that for me, and um, because I read this over and over, that has jumped out at me tonight, and they showed oh, that right. he wasn't obedient. Yeah, show, show, show me where you like put on net. I'm trying to find it. But... Oh, sorry, this is verse four. Yeah, he said nets. He uh, said let down net. your nets, plural, meaning your business nets. Yeah, because they were cleaning their nets. Yeah, correct. But then in verse five. Um, and then it ends up saying that he actually went out into the deep. And then he said, nevertheless, at, in verse 5, at thy word, I would let down the net. 
So here it is now. I mean, he wasn't really obedient. And sometimes we aren't obedient when God is telling us, okay, I have so much for you. And we just, okay, I'm only going to use this, Lord God. You know, that's, this is what I am I'm, I'm picking up. And uh, in verse you know, six. Um, you're right. It, it could have been a half-hearted attempt because yeah, right, it, there's, no, right. there's no indication that he even launched out into the deep like he went back out to go fishing. He probably and was then, hearing Jesus by just throwing the net into the water. Because he's been out there all night and he's like, this. <laughs> he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, Jesus. And then he just threw it overboard. But mm -hmm. it seemed like he went out and he with the fish one. Correct. But even despite his half-hearted manifestation of obedience of faith, God still responded. Still. Yes, he's still and there. I think, you know, that sometimes happens to us where, you know, God tells us to do something. I think even like the guy who dipped seven times in the river, like he went, he go, yeah, once, yeah, not no, clean. No. And then someone had to remind, he said seven times, okay. Uh, you know, like, but because you're still obedient, even though it's half-hearted. Um, and so that's a very good point too. I never saw that before. Um, very interesting, very interesting insight um, about seeing that. Is that, um, and that's why maybe he said he was a sinful man, right. is that he probably knew his heart. You know, you got to look at the power of what he probably knew his heart when he did it, but God still blew his mind. Like, oh, wow. I didn't think this was going to work, but I humored him and look at the results. It was better than he probably have, imagine. could imagine, yeah. even yeah. when he did everything right based on his understanding. And I never had that type of a level of success. Amen. Very interesting. But you know, I want to ask a question. Is this the only miracle of the overwhelming catch of fish that we have in the Gospels? Mm -hmm. Was there another time that this happened? When he came back, and the people had died, he came back. That's mm -hmm. the you mean in terms of a miracle? Yeah, they, we're reading the story and it sounds familiar. Is this the only time that Jesus did this? The no, miracle? When he, um, no, when he had the, um, the loaf of bread and one yeah. fish and he multiplied it. And when, that, when was that? Was that before the, the, the crucifixion or after? No, he's about the fish. The no, boy. he's right. He said a boy with a fish. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. you're talking about the boy with a fish. I thought you were talking about when they came to the show, he was already cooking the fish. Um, yeah, you're right. He did a miracle multiplying of fish, but I'm talking about the catch in terms of having a large catch of fish. Was there another time it was reported? It seemed like it would. It seemed like it would be the same, except there was facts in that story that told us what happened at a different point in his ministry. Anyone remember? In fact, that time it told us how much fish they catch too. I think it was 153. Jogging about his memory. Yeah, after after they had died, uh, I'm mean, sorry, after he had been had died. Who, who told us that story? Who who reported that one? I, get, I don't know. But I think the Gospel of John, right, chapter twenty-one. So I, I want us to search. I know you guys are Bible scholars. If, if there was another time in the Gospels when it reported a story of a large catch of fish. And at what point in Jesus' ministry that that particular story happened? When he died after his death, and when he came back to show that he was still alive, when the sightings occurred with him coming and meeting him, because they had returned back to being fishermen after okay. God had um after they had um Jesus had died, they went back to being fishermen, and then Jesus came there. Peter went back to what he he was was what which was familiar, mm -hmm. and Jesus showed up again just like he did the first encounter. This is what you call like a Peter had backslidden and he went looking for him again and he did the miracle he did in this book when he first called him. And why do you think um, he did it that way? What was he trying to remind him? Do you think there was a reason when Jesus did it that time? Of his calling. To remind him of his calling, that he was called to fish for men. And that he was not going to do it in his own power, his own efforts, but he was going to do it pursuant to the calling, the anointing of God upon his life. And it was all of them. It was also, it was, um, so I'm reading it, John 21, 
It says, after Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, which are the same guys, right? And two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon said. And they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And he called out, friends, haven't you, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw out your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon heard this, it is the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the full net of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish you have, you have just caught. And Simon climbed back into the boat with a drag, the net ashore, and it was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said, come have breakfast. And none of the disciples there asked him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And then in verse 15, after the breakfast, Jesus turned to Simon Peter. So he used the same event and then he turns to Simon Peter and he says, Simon Son of John, do you love me? More than these. More than these. And once again, Jesus is reminding him of his calling. And that he's using the same, a similar event to reaffirm the call of God on Peter's life. Peter, this is what you default to when things are not working out. This is what you, you default to when it gets rough uh, in the ministry. But you are called to bring men into the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. And do you love me, Peter, more than these? You know, stop running back to what seems to work, to your career, to what you figure, hey, this is going to get me by. Um, focus on the calling of God that's on your life, the gifting of God that is of repentance, and why God give you that gift, you know, and use it for the reason God gave it to you. And like we're saying, it, it has nothing to do with success because when God says, well done, it's because you stayed on point. You stayed on purpose. And that is what matters the most. A lot of times we lose our minds thinking, oh, it's, it's based on results. Sometimes results doesn't tell us the whole story. And God knows that. It has to do with being obedient to God and carrying out what God desires for us. So we see that God did the same miracle twice in different ways, but he did it to confirm for Peter that he was called. And his calling was without repentance to go and fish for men. And when Jesus died, he felt the whole ministry. Hey, I left fishing to go follow Jesus. Now the man was crucified. I, I done. I gone back to fishing. <laughs> Gig over. And Jesus said, you know, Peter, this was an everlasting calling. Uh, and I came back doing that miracle again just to remind you. Um, when I called you was to jog that memory of the calling of God on his life. Any other thoughts on that? All right, so we'll continue reading. Um, Luke chapter five, um, we're doing the book, the chapter five of Luke tonight. Um, thanks for those of you who are joining us. And we are now in verse 12 of Luke chapter 5. And it says, and it happened when he was in a certain city, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus, fell on his face and implored him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And then verse 13, then he put out his hand, touch him saying, I am willing to be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Now, the first thing that we need to realize here is that leprosy is a very contagious disease. 
and you don't touch people who have leprosy because that's how you would um, would you would be able to contract the leprosy. And so usually lepers would have to um, announce their presence um, when they come into the towns and let people know that they're leper, 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 lepers come in so that they would avoid them and not get contaminated by the illness. And so um, it's, in addition for it to be a contagious disease, it's also a very debilitating disease because they lose and the sensation, they actually um, can break the fingers, break the toes, yeah, lose limbs, et cetera, and not be aware of it because that's how um, the nerves were damaged as a result of the disease. And so there are people that are scorned, um, they are avoided, and they're despised. Um, and so in, um, in Jesus' time, the rabbis would not have anything at all to do with people who suffered from leprosy. They wouldn't even buy food from them. So these individuals had a very tough and difficult life as a result. And so the reason he told Jesus that if you are willing to, because he realized that Jesus had the power, but he also realized that it was, um, that, that it was, if he was like all the other men, they might've chosen not to help him, you know, not to give him what they had. And so he was very, um, he was doubtful about Jesus' um, willingness to give it to him, but he was not doubtful of Jesus' ability to help him. Right. And so that's the difference. Was he willing to help? Not that can he help? And so, um, and then we also noticed that when he spoke to him, he, he, he gave him the address of being Lord. He said, Lord. Um, in other words, Yahweh, like he recognized the Godship of Jesus. And he said, um, if you're willing, you, um, you can make me clean. And the cleansing that he's requesting here um, might not have been just of heal, healing, because then he would have said, if you're willing, you can heal me, right? But he said, you can make me clean. So you get the impression that he wanted more than just a physical healing, but he also wanted what God was, what Jesus was offering in the sense of the effect of his life and also his soul. And so when Jesus responded, responded to him, he said, I am willing. So Jesus was giving him the assurance that he was willing. And that was a simple answer to the big question that he had there. And, um, and therefore, um, the, the, he was willing and willing to, to heal him. And not only was he willing, but he was also willing to do what was not um, not wise in, the, in, in that time, so to speak, because like I mentioned, if you touch a leprous, a leprous person, you can become contaminated. But because God, Jesus wanted to extend compassion to him and also um, um, knowing that he was God, he would not have gotten infected. He um, touched the leper and um, made it very uh, compassionate, maybe even touched the heart of this afflicted man who probably haven't had a human touch for quite a long time. And as soon as Jesus touched him, voila, he no longer had leprosy. Um, and so that was the healing that Jesus provided for him. And um, this is how he chose at this time to heal him. And we know he used a lot of very strange tactics in the past, putting on the dirt and, you know, taking the clay and touching eyes and those other sort of things. But um, this particular time, he chose not even to speak. Other times he would choose not to come and send a word ahead. But this time he wanted to to touch this, this gentleman and extend his healing in that manner. Yeah. And a lot of times we get caught up in the antics of how things are done and not in the purpose or the plans of God as to why they are done that way. And so sometimes people imitate um, the antics or the rituals or the treatment methods and totally miss the purpose and the plans of God. And then they don't have the same effect. And the wonder why is because they are superstitious. They put too much credit into a process that God didn't authenticate. You know, there's things he authenticate. He tells us if there's any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. Those are specific instructions. So what we are doing are we are being obedient. Uh, we are having a call. So we are being obedient. We're following it because that is what um, the, the scriptures prescribe through the apostles. And so we're following godly instructions as to how to address sickness and disease in our midst. But Jesus, like we ever said, uh, chose so many ways to deal with, with um, sickness and disease in the midst of us. 
And so here he began to lay down the value system for his ministry on earth. And one of the things that has been the hallmark of the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry that should remain the hallmark of his ministry today is compassion. That Jesus had a heart of compassion. And that was one of his value system. He, he even rebuked his disciples when they had no compassion. You know, when they were saying about the lady with the alabaster oil, or oh, that money could have been whatever. He said, you're, not, you're being disingenuous because it wasn't uh, said with hearts of compassion, with a true motive. They cared more about the money. And so when you start caring more about um, the, the methods or the money or the institutions or the places instead of people, then you've elevated things beyond people and you've lost your compassion. And if you're going to be part of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, making a difference in the earth, one thing you have to pray and ask God for is that he give you hearts of compassion. But in order to understand the story, you also have to understand what Moses says concerning people who were ceremonially unclean. If you go to the book of Leviticus chapter 13, they had a whole process about being unclean. And so if this guy ended up where he was declared as a leopard. He had gone through seven days of being quarantined when the rash first broke up on his skin. Then the priest would call him again and look at him. And if it seemed like it was spreading, um, instead of declaring he was clean, he would, he would put him on another seven days of being quarantined. And then this thing really spread where they believe it was a serious skin disease, like leprosy. Then you were uh, put in a, relegated to a place where you had to stay away from people and then you had to wear bells on your clothes so people can hear you coming. And so there was a stigma attached to it, just like there was a stigma back in the day attached to HIV. You know, just by telling people you had it, you were scorned. People didn't even want to touch um, the fork or the, 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 the utensils you use because of our, our fear and misunderstanding of it. And it was the same way with leprosy, there was a stigma. You had to um, make songs with your clothes. And then on top of that, you had to cry out and say the very thing about yourself that you didn't even want people to know. Unclean, unclean, unclean. <laughs> so you're broadcasting your shame. Unclean, unclean. And uh, this is going on. So now let's get back to the story. So Moses says, hey, when you're unclean, that is, when you have leprosy, that is how you behave. And we come to a story where this guy, instead of being relegated out to the outcast, to the, the place of the outcast, he's in the city searching so what is he searching for and the impression i get is he's searching for jesus and so the the message of the power of the lord jesus christ not only with the miracles but the fish had already began to spread abroad early in his ministry that this guy with leprosy began to break the commands of the laws of moses in terms of staying in this valley or this desolate place with bears and crying out unclean for every person who's passing by and begins to be actively among the clean. He's not supposed to be there in a city or in a village looking for Jesus. He's looking for Jesus. And what that tells us, as many demonstrations would, it tells us his faith. It tells us his faith. And so when we see miracles happening, it's not like Jesus coincidentally bump into somebody. And so, oh, by the way, you want to be clean? Let's be clean. These people was actively seeking Jesus out because they believed that Jesus could heal them. And that is what God has always said through his Holy Scriptures. He said, they, they who search for me will find me when they search for me with all their hearts. This is happening for this gentleman. He's searching for the Christ. And God miraculously put Jesus in his way. You know, he's, he's creating the encounter this man desires because he wants to be clean. And just his response to Jesus tells us that he believes and knows that Jesus can heal him. But he doesn't know if, if whether he wants to. And that has to be it's something I learned in bankruptcy when we did bankruptcy in Houston. They said people do things for two reasons, because they can and because they want to. He never doubted the power of God the Son to be able to heal him. What he wanted to know, and that's where compassion comes in, does he wants me? I want to be healed by him, but does he wants to heal me? And Jesus confirmed something that should be assurance for all of us. Not only does God have the power to, but God wants to. And it's the same thing with our sin, which is the greatest leprosy of all mankind. For God so loved the world. He not only can forgive us of our sin, but he wants to. 
forgive us of our sin. And so many people live in, a, in condemnation of themselves, not believing that God will ever choose, not that he can't, but that he will be willing to forgive them of their sins. They say, Pastor, I'm such a terrible person. You don't know what I've done. Allah is wrestling with the fact, does God want to heal me? Does God want to save me? Does God want to help me? And the resounding answer is yes. God wants to. And in the earlier part of his ministry, God demonstrated that for this man who had leprosy, who actually searched him out. He's already breaching protocol. He's actually already breaching protocol. And a lot of times you have to become aggressive or let's use the word that's more positive, assertive and going after God for what you, what you want. Because the world doesn't care about outcomes, all the world cares about is that you satisfy what they think is important. Like blind by teams, they was thinking, oh, we're having this formal meeting. We're so into what Jesus is teaching. Oh, could you please be quiet? We can't hear him. But he's like, no, no, I ain't missing this chance. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Because he knew that that is the moment that matters. And he reached the heart of Jesus, who stopped in the middle of his teaching to address his need. He called for God based on his need. And even now, in the middle of our teaching, Bible study services, Sunday morning worship, God is saying to you, you can call on him. You can make a demand in the spirit for what you need. And God will respond. God will respond. The most important person in any service is you the most important person and god will stop a whole ceremony to speak specifically to your heart into your circumstance because he cares about what happens to you and that's why the apostle says cast all your cares on him for he cares for you he wants to he wants to and then pastor river you made such a, a, a point about jesus touching and that's so important that was another prohibition. You were not supposed to touch the unclean. And the way Moses said it, because he's like COVID-19, you know, wear your mask, you wear your mask. We are not doing that today. <laughs> yeah, you wear your mask, you wear your mask. Because we are, we are, we are really concerned about uh, contamination and that when you are, and like she said in Haggai, uh, if I'm clean and I touch the unclean, uh, they didn't believe the clean could make the unclean clean. And that if you touch the unclean, the unclean would definitely make the clean unclean. And so here's Jesus, Moses saying, no, you can't touch them. Don't come near them. They got one to touch you. Then you now also become ceremonially unclean. So they've transferred their uncleanliness to you. Not with the divine. Jesus touches him, not only to show his compassion, but to show his power. Because with him, just like with him forgiving us of his sins, when he touches us, he, he as the clean person can make us who are unclean clean and that's what he demonstrated him not only do i have compassion but i touch you to show you that i as the person who is healed who is well when i touch you i can transfer what's on me to you happened with a woman with the issue of blood she was also convinced about her touch if i but touch the hem of his garment i know she said i will be healed i know i just want to touch him um and, you know, Jesus could have spoke a word. We've seen that happen and he could have been healed. He could have been way over on the other side in the place of desolation. And Jesus could have sent the word and healed him. But Jesus chose to touch him. And I believe on Sunday, it's amazing how God works. Even before we began, I began to study this for tonight's lesson. Somebody told me about the power of touch. And it was a powerful um, lesson. I, I, I'm wondering if they'll be willing to share. Sister Carolyn Miller was telling me um, the effect of power that touch has on, on us as human beings. When we touch somebody else, what actually begins to happen in the next person when we touch them? So Dr. Miller, would you want to share about the power of touch, the human touch? Sister Carolyn? Uh, yes. So, um... Do you remember our conversation about touch? <laughs> Okay, put me on the spot. Um, yeah, I know, I'm, right? <laughs> right. I was just talking to him about how human touch um, actually elicits a neurotransmitter that helps to soothe 
and to helps us to relax. And so I was just saying that I was talking to Pastor Carl about how um, the enemy doesn't want us to touch, especially during COVID-19. And we have to be careful of that, obviously, you know, touch people that are in your family or in your circle, et cetera. But how important it is uh, to touch because when we are in times like this where we have so much stress, touch is one of the ways to help us de-stress. And if we are all socially distanced and we're not touching, then we have one less uh, type of resource at our disposal to help to uh, reduce stress. So that's what I was talking about with respect to the power of touch. Thank you so much. Thank that was you. so well done. <laughs> Thank you for accommodating me. And so I just wanted you to show you the power of touch and why God has given it to us both in the church and both in our families and how much good is done by the human touch. Uh, in African-American circles, people are so touchy-feely. Don't touch me out. But when we begin to understand uh, this amazing gift that God uses and that Christ made available, that Christ used many times to bring about healing and transformation, both in the bodies, but in the lives and in the souls of men. When he says, and he touched them, it speaks of so much overwhelming power. And I just wanted to highlight that for you. And thanks to Carolyn for helping us do an amazing job sharing that as well. The other thing that was interesting, uh, it was 14, that when, after Jesus finished healing him, he charged him to not to tell anyone. Was that because of the leprosy? Was that because he touched him and he had leprosy? That's what we're gonna, that's what I want to ask. But he said, go and show yourself to priests and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses has commanded. Why do you think Jesus told him not to tell anyone? Why be secretive about your healing? Well, uh, not you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I don't. You could answer after. <laughs> I'm reading the same thing I, I, <clears throat> Anyone? Anyone want to give a, a stab at that talk? Why tell him not to tell anyone? All right. So, what do you think would have happened if if the if the people heard about the fact? that um, Jesus had just healed somebody of leprosy. What could have happened? They would have shown Jesus um, thinking that he caught leprosy, knowing so there, that he healed someone. So there was a possibility that they might have felt that, that, um, that therefore he was now unclean based on, on those um, prior teachings that we just learned. And what else could have happened also when these great miracles occur? What tends to happen with people? The him, Jesus himself, can um, can now become a celebrity as a healer, right? And people can start wanting to to follow him as they were already for the miracles and not for um, for his teaching. his teaching. And the thing about it is that based at least based on the way it's being presented here by um, by Luke. This would have been the miracle, the first miracle that was being um, publicly done. I just want to go back to make sure because each each uh, the, the demon, the the demon one was the first one, right? And then after that, I was it. Yeah. yeah. Though he healed many people. Okay, he's been healed before, but I think this is the first one that is a a, a leper that has been healed. Um, but um, the the fact is that you you are supposed to give a testimony about Jesus healing um but it's but it's not you know that time sometimes it's chosen to do to he wants uh, the whole miraculous thing to be done as a private testimony and at other times he wants to be a public testimony and this particular thing there was still going to be a testimony because he still was going to go because he needed to go to the priest to be declared clean and not a friend to be allowed to re, to re-enter into um the community um, and so they show and tell what was going to happen according to the commands that Moses had given to them. Um, I, I have a different thought. Mm -hmm. I think Jesus was reminding him of the protocols. 
You remember Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. And that he knew that Moses had a reason based on the instructions of God for establishing the protocols of being declared cer ceremonially unclean or clean. That was for the protection of the welfare of the communities. And so now when Jesus had not to go around, because I remember he was known to be a leper, just go around telling your story and get distracted with it. Um, you were not allowed to... Um, you were not allowed to have sex as well to segue back into the community without the priest first clear, giving you a clearance. It was your bill of clearance to then um, re-engage society in terms of your normal activities. Mm -hmm. And so he actually told him to go and show himself to the priest, the Leviticus 14, take the offerings that's prescribed. So he's telling him to follow protocol, let the priest clean you. That's a public testimony. He will have to explain to the priest that he was a leopard, that he met this man and now he's changed and they have to examine his spots, see that they were actually being reduced or they had dried up, they were gone. And um, then he had to make his offering. Then the priest had to sanction him and declare him clean. Then he could have gone about his life. That to me, Sharon, that's show and tell as well. That's a mm -hmm. testimony, that's a public testimony. But I think Jesus was reminding the art in which to do it. Mm -hmm. That is so important. Really um, and I think that is showing how God says, that we have to respect the authorities that are over the land. And just because uh, like a miracle happened, when, if you come to church and you got clear of leprosy, if the Department of Health still need to give you a bill uh, to be clean, you know, and I say, oh yeah, go down to tap and stills uh, tonight. There's a good crowd on there and show them how clean you are. I say, you know, the first thing you do is tomorrow morning, go down to the Department of Health, go to so-and-so, um, let them examine you. So there's a way to go about being re-engaged into society. I believe that, that that's, you know, that's my impression that Jesus was actually coaching him. Now you breached protocol and seeking me out. And I responded to your, your heart in finding me because of what you needed. Mm -hmm. But now that you receive what you needed, there's a way you go about being reinserted into society. And I'm telling you, that's the order you follow. Right. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm thinking. Yes, and then, yeah. I, I was actually thinking about it outside yeah. you were saying it yeah. because yeah. also, um, you know, it's the same thing as if like if you had gotten healed of a miracle, whether I say it was a cancer or whatever you have, and you feel you have a healing, you still want confirmation. Yes. So you still want the the um, the doctor or whoever to to search you over, examine you, and then say that it's gone. You know what it is? It's been healed of COVID. Suppose mm -hmm. you you have COVID. And we prayed for you, and we are absolutely convinced as well as you, because the symptoms have diminished or believe that you are healed of COVID. But people know you just got caught COVID, so they say you got to be quarantined for 14 okay. days or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if it has prescription as to how you are um, declared negative, then you just can't go back to work. Oh, Pastor God prayed for me, and the symptoms left. Mm -hmm. People are going to still want to know that you're free of COVID. And so the thing is, you will probably have to go down to the Cranston lab or whatever, test negative, and then do whatever and get that clearance, and then you're reinserted. I think that's that's what's mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a better modern day example of how you go about experiencing a miracle by God's power, and how you go about satisfying the requirements of the society in which we live and mm -hmm. the regulations in terms of continuing on with our lives. So, however, the report in verse 15 and 16 of Luke chapter 5, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great miracles came together to hear. Great multitudes, sorry, came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness oh, and correct. prayed. So, um, so that was why I, I thought it was more to... To keep the mm -hmm. the um well remember he only gave the guy the instructions yet he had uh, simon he had all these other people who were witnessing it he didn't give them the same instructions they would have they could do the same thing that he's telling this guy not to do mm -hmm. it wasn't like he did it in secret it was only him, the two of them so like i don't say nothing you don't say nothing you know you got all these other people who are being blown away by mm -hmm. the level of these miracles they're gonna chat you know and as we can see even in the earlier part of chapter five that multitudes, great crowds were already pressing in on him. You see in verse one. So mm -hmm. he, he was already drawing a crowd um, 
And and so that crowd is anywhere around him when this guy finds him is only going to get bigger, you know, because. Right. And also, of course, um, the other important thing here is the fact that even though he had the crowd and he had the fame, he did something that was very important. He always took the Sabbath and withdrew himself and prayed. Yes. Prayer was important to him. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times as we get busy in ministry, we lose sight of those things, prayer and teaching. Yeah. That he, he never wanted his miracles to eclipse his teaching because the message was more important than the, the, um, the miracles. And he never wanted it to eclipse his ministry whether it's teaching and miracles to eclipse his personal relationship with God. That's what he treasured. So he would withdraw from even the activity of his ministry so that he could spend time in a solitary place with God. Mm -hmm. And because he valued the relationship with God, I believe he had that sustaining power that was evident in his life. And he wasn't preaching from being drained or empty, but he was always ministering from his overflow. Because he, 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 like his disciples knew, and I believe they learned from Jesus, as such as I have, I give to you. Many of us are seeking to give to people what we don't have because we have allowed ourselves to burn out or be depleted or to be exhausted or to be over um, expended uh, without putting anything back. And Jesus would always break away from the demands of even his earthly ministry, which seemed to be doing so much good so that he could spend time in prayer, uh, spend time in intimacy and privacy with his heavenly father. Yeah. And it's all we should do also. Yes. Don't allow the demands of life to push us away from prayer, but rather to push us towards prayer. prayer. Amen. Amen. And verse 17 to 19, it says, Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went on the house top and let him down with his bed to the ceiling in the midst of Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said to them, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees became, began to reason saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? What is easy to say, verse 23 to 26, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately he arose up before them, took up what, had been, what he was lying on, departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear saying, we have seen stranger things. Amazing things today. Amazing things today. Amen. So what 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 seems to be interesting about this, and it still happens today, let me ask another thing. In your estimation, what is the greatest miracle that Jesus has performed us or performed story. yeah in this story in the world in the gospels what is the greatest miracle that jesus performs when he raised lazarus from the dead who, who said that Greg. coach mm -hmm. coach craig okay uh to raise the dead and specifically lazarus okay we have that notable story so that's the greatest to raise miracle Oh, sorry, to raise himself from the dead. He said, no man has um, laid down his life and take it and back up his own. No man can take my life. So you is raising yourself from the dead. Yeah, that, that, that yeah the work out, basically the work at a cross. Okay. 
Anyone else? My only, my only, um, and this is not for debate, but my only uh, reports to that would be that, well, nobody witnesses that, but they witness the reason of, um, of Lazarus. So I think in terms of um, miracle, that would be an audience somewhat, right? People being um, faith increased possibly, rather than, okay, you go to an empty tomb and he's gone. I mean, that's, that in of itself is a miracle, but if I stand up and watch somebody come back to life, to me, that's more impactful than going to see a tomb that I know is supposed to be, up, supposed to have somebody. I ain't seen nobody put him in there, but I go back to the tomb, is empty, but then I watch Lazarus come back to life and I know for sure, because I went to his funeral, <laughs> Lazarus was dead. So I'm saying in terms of the greatest miracle, not to be a debate with Josh, but if, if we were to say greatness, that would be an impact type um, conversation, right? Well, well, uh, well, there was over 500 uh, witnesses. Uh, <laughs> the, Thomas, the greatness of the miracle. Uh, this, this brings up uh, eternal debate. If a tree falls mm -hmm. in, in the forest and no one is around, does it make a sound? Yeah, it, and, and that's what exactly I was going to say, Pastor Carl. I think uh, today we focus on greatest miracles based on who witnessed it. But there are times when God does things that we don't even know about. So we don't even count it as a miracle because we don't know about it. So, um, you know, and, we, and even within churches, sometimes, you know, we, we, you know, we look, people look for audiences, you know, but like the song says, an audience of one is what is, what is done in our heart and what God and Jesus knows what's in our heart, not what we look for credit from man. Well, I mean, I, I primarily talking about impact, right? So, you know, impact, increasing people's faith. You know, some people seeing, they have to see versus hearing versus somebody saying it. You know, I, I, I look at it from an impact standpoint. So, and, and I appreciate that. So, but we have two people. One is raising yourself from the dead. Everything has to be doing with raising from the dead. And one is raising Lazarus from the dead. Two noticeable events, uh, definitely in the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. Anyone else? Um, how about you, Alkin? What do you think is the greatest miracle that Jesus performed in the Gospels? <laughs> um, well, truthfully, it might sound simple and then really the greatest, but even um, the loaves and fish, um, from a, a, a scientific standpoint, people could raise that both Jesus and um, Lazarus was in a deep sleep where the glass and the skin and John, where they got skinny, 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 you know? Um, but the loaves and fish, you know, for a fact, there were only two and five. And it just keep coming, no matter how you divide anything up, you know, it, it keep going up to zero. Um, but these fish never get on the add extra. So I really, I wouldn't say that's the greatest miracle, but if you want to look at it from a logical standpoint, you, you know, um, people could argue that Jesus wasn't dead yet if they wanted to, you know. Um, likewise, Lazarus here, he had started to stink, you know, but... I don't know. Honestly, all of them were great miracles. Cause I no, can't they're, all, they're all notable miracles. But I'm trying to zero in on what's the greatest miracle. Anybody else has any other thoughts they would like to share? You 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 want to ask me what I think is the greatest miracle that yeah. Jesus? <laughs> and it's right here and it gets lost on us every time. It doesn't get in the woods. It doesn't get in the stand up. It doesn't get, the, get anybody speculating. And Jesus does it all the time because in his estimation it was the greatest miracle. And he keeps performing it to this very day. And that is the forgiveness of sin. Salvation is the greatest miracle. And that's what this story is about. That when Jesus forgives people their sins, we treat it like, oh, nothing special happened. But if he gives us money, if he raises us from the dead, we're going to die again. But we, we, we don't mind keep doing that. Ah, alive, dead. Ah, alive. And um, 
because those things are physical to us. But the greatest miracle that Jesus performed, and he was trying to draw the attention to that, that the, the, son, of, the son of Man came to save men from their sins. It is transforming us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It is where we pass from death unto life permanently. And nothing can change that. No man can take us from his hands. Whom the son says, it's, he began to understand that, that eternally God rewrites our lives through the forgiveness of sin. It is the greatest miracle. But when people talk about their salvation and go back there, oh, I got saved today. Oh, nothing. Get people get saved in the church, people walking out, guys, people are getting saved because we don't see the value of the greatest miracle that God continues to perform in our day. And that is the miracle of salvation. And in this story, it was lost on these people. They only say they saw amazing things when Jesus said, stand up and walk, pick up your bed and walk. And oh, we saw amazing things. But he did a greater miracle when he says to him, your Jesus sins forgiven. are forgiven. You know what I'm saying? Because you can be healed but not have your sins forgiven. You can be a healed sinner. You can be a raised from the dead sinner. And if God leave you in your sins, resurrected, <laughs> you're no better off. Is that making sense? Anyone has any thoughts about that? But that was being impressed upon me is that Jesus came to forgive men of their sins. And every time you forgive people of their sins, people had an issue with it. It wasn't nothing. But other thing else, they're like, oh, this is so amazing. This is so spectacular. Oh, you know. But the forgiveness of sin is the greatest miracle. And I think sometimes it gets lost in us. We pray for people to get healed in their hospitals. But once they come out of the hospital, nobody will go witness to them about their salvation. We just let them continue to live. We pray for people to get homes. We pray for people's children to go off to college and God to pay for this and God to pay for that. God to give me this, God to give me that. Then you say, but why don't we desire their salvation? Oh, that. And yes, but that is the most important thing that God can do in the life of people. And that is to save them from the sins. And so even when Jesus got frustrated with our, um, with our attachment to miracles and food, uh, at the end of his ministry, he said to them, oh, you guys are only following me for the miracles and the food. Mm -hmm. And I said, many of them got offended and stopped following from that day. But he told them, they're right. He said, you, all, you, you guys didn't want to be changed. You guys didn't kind of care about the message and the teaching. You just care about the show, the miracles, the spectacular. And every now and again, the food. And they were offended. But he told them the truth because he was frustrated that they were missing the bigger picture. That the son of man came to seek and save Luke 19.10, those who were lost, those who were lost. And you know, I see it so often people talk about if, if man, if I could perform miracles, I would have the largest church. You know, the sad reality is that I've seen so many people have those gifting. And the truth be told, because there's no teaching and there's nothing else, they have some of the smallest churches in the world. They travel and they draw large audiences, but you follow them back to their church and they are small because Jesus wanted to keep the emphasis where it matters, a relationship with God that is born in the forgiveness of sin and then through personal devotion and prayer and then build on a foundation of sound teaching and the miracles will follow. Signs and wonders is to confirm the message and not the other way around. The message is not to confirm the miracles. The miracles and the signs is to confirm the message. And the message is clear that Jesus came to forgive the sins of you and I. And that is what we desperately need more than anything else in all the world. So Jesus calls Levi, you want us to do that? Yes, so that's the last um, portion. Um, 29 to 32. I have a, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So, so then grace would be a miracle. 
The forgiveness of sin. I call it a miracle. And the miracle is that cause nobody else can do it. Nobody else can do it. It's a miracle because we don't even understand. It's a mystery. We don't even understand how it's done. You know, how can how we can become sons and daughters of God, how we can be put in right standing with God, how we can have access to the holiest place of all reserved for the priest. That we can come into the holiest place of all, we can call God Daddy, Abba Father. We can call him with that title because of the forgiveness of sin. How that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord Jesus Christ. That death loses its power over us by the forgiveness of sin. You know, you understand all that happens in salvation. Um, that we've been given access to everything that pertains to life and godliness to the forgiveness of sin. That we've been okay. made, we've been made heirs with Christ. And you understand the status we've been made. I I, I follow. I follow. Uh, yeah. It's 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 un it's unexplainable, it's unimaginable. So yeah, that 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 is that is in the in the, in the cracks of it. That's that is a miracle. Yeah. Why you break it down like that? Yeah. You know why I want to emphasize it? I think the church needs to get more excited when people get saved. You know. I think we need to be way more excited when people get saved because it speaks of a, a total transformation of their future from that moment on. More than if God came down and gave them a thousand dollars so they could pay their rent that they were behind on. You know, those are temporary things. Even the resurrection from death, like I said, you're gonna die again. Those are temporary things. But but the forgiveness of sin and eternal salvation is permanent. It's permanent. And that's why Jesus says, no man can snatch you from my hand. You know, that's the, the time of the security of what he actually gave us, you know. We have to actually renounce God and walk away from him. But he, he won't walk away from us. Can I add just one thing, Pastor? Sure. You know, um, I think, you know, I agree with you that the for forgiveness is the biggest thing. And I think the reason it is, is because of who God is. If I'm just forgiven, I, you know, who am I? I'm not anyone compared to the maker of the universe. And, you know, um, David says that, you know, who is man that you are mindful of him, you know, that you think of us. And he says that after he says, when I consider the heavens and all the works of your hand, when I consider who you are, then this, that's what makes it so great. Yes. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. That you know, he, he could start over. I mean, someone who creates all this for him to yearn for us like he does, to be willing to overlook our past offenses and wrongs so he could have a relationship with us. I mean, he created us to begin with, you know, he could have started over. Uh, no, but rather he chose another way. He, he redeemed us. And he paid for us twice. He created us and then he redeemed us mm. after we had fallen into the wrong hands. You know, oh, what man of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we are lost for words. And, um, and I believe that that reality needs to overwhelm our souls. But also when people get saved, that deep appreciation that something significant has happened. When we see people walk our eyes and and has given their lives to, to, to the Lord Jesus Christ, that this is the greatest miracle. It's, it's more valuable, valuable than anything else he could do for them before and after their encounter with the cross. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, um, it's 8.55, so I think we can pick up Levi next week. We give God thanks for all of his people. This has been an amazing study, even uh, for those who participate, especially for those who participate because you really help. And um, and even the miracles, those are notable ones too. What I'm sharing with you, it, it took me a while to came to that realization because I was one too that hungered and thirst after the spectacular. And if God would only do such and such and such and such, you know, and then you begin to realize that, but he's, he's performing great things among you, just like he was forgiven this man of sins, but it felt like it, it felt flat, like, oh, <laughs> and it's, and then he showed up and helped somebody pay their month's rent, like, ah, oh, God, this is, you know, wildfire. But uh, to really begin to 
tuned in to those incredible things that God does for us, even in amazing ways. You know, people don't see him sustaining 2 million people in the wilderness as a miracle, you know, what manna from heaven is. But, you know, God able, able to support us during our difficult times. He said, oh, it's been a long time. But God supporting us during COVID. We haven't lost our minds. We still have joy in our hearts. The peace of God still underrates us. That's a miracle in itself. You know, he could have ended COVID when we act within seven days, within three days. He could have done it. But even now, what we're going through is a miracle. And to begin to appreciate it for that. Um, and to begin to, to view life with fresh eyes. as how God is involved with us. And how his plans include us. And how he's perfecting everything concerning us in his time. To the honor and glory of God the Father. We give him all praise. Amen. So this Nothing else to add, we're going to pray. Um, Brother Joshua, could you just close us up in prayer at this time? I love and appreciate all of you. Thank you for being on the line. Thank you for your contributions. We're going to pick up um, from Luke 5, uh, the story about Matthew Levi being called, and we'll continue from there um, next Tuesday. So we're asking you to tune in once again at 7.30 p.m. Same time, we'll be doing it online, our online Bible Institute. And so we begin to actually to share the word, um, let people know that Bible study has restarted once again. And then we're going to see you on Sunday. Thursday. Uh, Thursday is all day of fasting. It's the absolute fast. You're allowed to drink unsweetened teas. Still asking you to stay away from coffee, caffeine. I know there's caffeine in teas, but not as much. And so you could have unsweetened teas or infused water. Uh, there are a lot of recipes about how to do infused waters. Or you can just drink pure distilled water right. um, mm -hmm. from sunrise to sunset. And we'll be going into prayer at 6 a.m., noon, and 6 p.m. And then when we end our prayer at 7, then you have been free to break your fast and go back to regular diet. And that's every Thursday. And that's every Thursday we'll be doing that. And then on Sunday mornings, for those of you who are serving um, God in any location, we're asking you to tune in at 6 a.m. for prayer, for what we call our holy huddle. And then we're inviting all of God's people with their family and their friends and their co-workers to be with us on our Sunday morning worship. We've been having some amazing services. I'll tell you, don't miss this move of God. Um, by the time you hear about it, it will be probably be too late. So make sure you're there and you have a front row seat to what God is about to do next in our lives, in our church, and in our community. Let us pray. Father, we love Oh, Joshua, I'm sorry. <laughs> Joshua, I almost set you free. <laughs> I was waiting. I was waiting till you were finished. <laughs> Bl blame Pastor Reba. <laughs> no, no, no. I meant, I meant, I thought you had uh, forgot about me. Oh, no, 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 I have forgotten. No, the point of three is. All right. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight to God. We thank you for the breath of life. We thank you, Father, for this time of refreshing where we could learn from your word uh, to be reminded of how great and powerful you are, to be reminded of God of the greatest miracle that ever happened, our salvation, oh God, and this free gifts of salvation and grace that you have bestowed unto us, oh God. Father, we pray, oh God, that you would carry us through the week, oh God, that you would help us to face every challenge, oh God, knowing that you are greater, you are stronger, you are much more powerful than anything that we could face, oh God, and that we have a God who loves us, who is able to save us, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we could actually think about, oh God. We pray, oh God, Lord, that your late name will be lifted and magnified through our lives. I pray that we will be that light, oh God, that shine it. Lord, that men will see your good works and glorify you in heaven, oh God. I pray, oh God, Lord, that you would continue to keep us uh, safe, oh God. Continue, oh God, to remind us of your greatness and who you are. And bring us back to the next appointed time in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Have an amazing day. Evening and a great night's nice rest. God bless you. Nice. Blessings, nice. everyone. Good night. Good evening. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.
Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.